hunch. <laughs> That's my hunch. <laughs> Anyway, so we'll talk about some demons. <laughs> you got your revolutionary t-shirt, great. <laughs> it's a nice t-shirt, it's really nice. Yeah, who's that, me? <laughs> I'm not cool. Um, <laughs> Cold. <laughs> Cold. Okay, so um, I guess we're already a little behind the schedule, but we'll continue with the program. Um, maybe we should do Jai Radhamana because it looks like we're a little sparse in our population here. Hey, wake up! <laughs> Jeep Jago! Come on and dance and chant. <laughs>
जम्मून भगवान दामन भगवान
All glories to the assembled devotees, glories to the assembled devotees, glories to Sri Guru and Sri Guranga, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So, Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaurvani Pacharine Nirvasesa Sunyavari Pastyatyare Satarine Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasati Gauda Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare So there's a lot to cover and the time is short. Before we start, again we want to encourage devotees who haven't done so to stop by Mother Vishaka's table outside and get yourself a couple books and help to propagate and proliferate this wonderful film that was made by the devotees on Hare Krishna, the mantra, the, ma the mission, and the person, Swami, who started it. So for $25, you get two wonderful books. Her personal account of how she came to Krishna consciousness and all the things that followed, which is... A, I must say, that book, I read it in March of this year, and I couldn't put it down. It's amazing. It's incredible. You can read the write-ups and the responses by the devotees. It's a masterpiece and liter literary description of how, you know, a person comes from a very, what we say, obscure background and becomes what we say a very intimate devotee of Lord of uh, Srila Prabhupada. It's an amazing book. <clears throat> It'll keep your attention and if you really want to read this is something I would especially recommend. And she gives another book which she also authored called Harmony and which is about Bhagavad Gita and its relationship with uh, Krishna's creation. And then also a wonderful t-shirt. We have one t-shirt wearer right here. <laughs> Mother Bonnie is wearing one of the t-shirts. So all these things help to uh, pre 
push on Krishna consciousness so for a small donation you can get something wonderful and at the same time do some service to push on Krishna consciousness. And if you want to give more, it's allowable. <laughs> give as much as you can. Okay, so <clears throat> this particular section, as I mentioned, there's a lot to cover and time is limited. There's a wonderful book. It's been released also, I think, last year. It's uh, called Manashiksha, Sri Manashiksha which is a treatise on the, on the process of pure devotional service. It is actually Raghunath Das Goswami's work on describing, in a nutshell, or even what we might even say, a PowerPoint presentation on how to become Krishna conscious. There's only 11 verses. The 12th verse is a uh, Falasuti. Falasuti means by reading these 11 verses, what you get, follow means fruit, like the fruit of such reading. And uh, in that, he just talks about pride. Now, a lot of the struggles that we come in contact with in our Krishna consciousness um, is also due to pride. <laughs> um, they say a pauper is proud of his penny. And so we find pride is on from the highest to the lowest. Indra was so proud that he neglected to understand that he was trying to cause home harm to Krishna's intimate associate. Indra is a devotee of Krishna, but at the same time, his pride didn't allow him to see the residence of Vrindavan as Krishna's parts and parcels, and therefore he tried to destroy them in a torrential rainstorm. So we see how pride can attack even great souls and everyone in between. And there's different kinds of pride. <clears throat> so in Manushiksha by Raghunath Das Goswami, he mentions six demons which correspond or correlate with six types of pride. And those demons are Sakatashura, um, Trinavarta, Aristasura, Keshi, and two other, what we say, pastimes that are not demons. But Krishna destroys the pride of Nalakuvera Manigriva and the Yagya Brahmins. So these six incidents re represent different types of pride. They say pride goeth before the fall. Mm, that's a statement in the Christian tradition. Um, it's very hard to free oneself from pride because pride comes in different forms. It comes by one's birth, comes by one's bodily characteristics, it comes one by one's education, it comes by one's position, it comes by one's achievements. So pride can come from different angles and then it makes one think in a wrong way. Um, when pride comes and it becomes enlarged or perpetuated, then Krishna does something to destroy that pride. <clears throat> he takes action. Usually when pride is in its small form, Krishna just reminds us through philosophy or through an ordinary situation. But when one does not heed his warnings and pride continues, then he becomes a little stronger. <laughs> and he, that's one thing proud Krishna cannot tolerate is pride. So I'll read some of the demons which represent different kinds of pride. And the first one is Sakadasura, represents a load-carrying mentality arising out of old and new bad habits. 
Now carrying around bad habits, bringing in new ones, carrying around old ones, and from previous life and from this life. He represents lethargy, dullness, and false pride. Krishna removes this contamination by kicking it aside. So when Krishna was first born, he was just a little tiny baby, although he's the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he appears in his form as a little baby. And now, uh, his mother is having a ceremony, and he is one year old. So in the ceremony, there's a lot of festivities, festivals going on, festivities going on. Brahmins are there, and there's a lot of cooking, guests are coming. So she's very busy taking care of other things, and she puts Krishna down underneath a cart. Now, in her busyness, she forgets that Krishna's there, and Krishna's crying, he's hungry, but she can't hear him. She can't hear him. And so Krishna gets a little disturbed. He's, my, I'm calling for my mother, I'm hungry, she's not hearing. So sometimes when a baby becomes a little bit unhappy, it starts throwing its legs and arms in different directions. Yes, mothers, you all know about that. How many mothers we got here? The baby starts to kick. So Krishna, acting like an ordinary baby and being neglected, he decided to kick. And he kicked the cart. Now he's got a soft little lotus feet. It's so soft that butter becomes hard in comparison to Krishna's feet. He's so soft. And then, but when he kicked the cart, the wheel of the cart broke, the axle cracked in half, and the whole cart came crashing down. And all the utensils, pots, pans, and everything there for the cooking was scattered all over the ground. The cart made a tremendous sound. Everyone ran to see what happened. Krishna was all right. He was underneath the cart. He was all right. <clears throat> and they were wondering, what happened? How did the cart get kicked? How did the cart fall down? And so no one saw it except Krishna's little playmates, which, who were a little older than him. So they said, Krishna kicked it and it fell. <laughs> So the elderly said, this is childish talk. How can this little baby kick this huge cart, which is full of utensils, weighs tremendous amount of weight? How is it possible? No, no, we saw it. He did it. It crashed down. Boom. But that cart was a demon. The, the demon entered into the cart in the form of air. Now this demon didn't have a physical body, he had an airy body. And then Krishna kicked that, and when he did, he killed the demon. <laughs> the demon was killed when the cart came crashing down, but nobody could see the demon because it was made out of air. So this Sakata Shura, he's a rascal. Um, who is he? In his previous life, he was a demon. And he was the son of Hiranyaksa, called Utkacha. He went to the hermitage of Lumasamuni and broke some trees, and he was cursed to become bodiless. <laughs> and Masamuni said, all right, you have a huge body and you're just causing havoc. No more body for you. <laughs> he became a nobody. <laughs> and so <laughs> he was still there but he was kind of like invisible and then the and then the Muni uh, after he got cursed in his previous life he begged the Muni please give me some you know, mercy the Muni said 
um, when many millenniums later, when Krishna appears, he will, you will be touched by his foot and you'll be liberated. So that was the mercy. So this demon represents uh, laziness. Someone asked Prabhupada, is laziness demonic? Prabhupada said, no, it's worse. <laughs> is there anybody here lazy? Oh my God. Are you kidding? Or this is a joke? <laughs> lazy. Prabhupada tells a story about um, laziness. There was one kingdom, and in this kingdom there was a, a king and a minister. And people would come to the minister and said, give me a place to stay, give me some food. But they wouldn't do any work. So the minister was getting requests one after another. People wanted free lodging and free food and not do anything. Sounds like, you know, today's society. <laughs> and so the king said, hmm, this is a problem. So he told the minister, you build a huge house to house many, many people, and we'll make an announcement. Anyone in the kingdom who is lazy can come here and live here free. We'll give them food. They don't have to do anything. Okay, so people started to come and quickly the house was filled. <laughs> Mostly brahmacharis. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Ex-brahmacharis. <laughs> so the house was filled up and then the king told the minister, set the house on fire. <laughs> So in the middle of the night, he sets the house on fire. And then everyone starts running out, except two guys. One guy looks at the other one and says, it's getting a little warm in here. <laughs> the other one said, don't worry, just roll over on the other side. <laughs> so the minister reported about these two men and the king says, you can feed them, they're actually lazy. <laughs> So you get the point? <laughs> point is for one's vested interest, uh, we, no one is lazy, but when it comes to serving Krishna, got no time, got no time. <laughs> so therefore, that's the point that this laziness is not a, it's a very undesirable quality. It's not a quality, it's a misquality. Dullness, Dullness means, you tell, Prabhupada said there's three kinds of personal servants, first class, second class, and third class. The first class servant, he knows what to do without being told. The second class, he'll, you tell him something and he'll do it, but he has to be told. The third class, you tell him, he goes out of the room and comes back in and said, what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we want to be at least second class <laughs> Third, first class is very rare especially in these days so yeah this dullness one has to be how do we be what does dullness means means too much sense gratification if one engages in sense gratification in the early parts of their life when they come to later life, they, their minds are what they call destroyed. That's why it says that education, especially spiritual education and guidance should start from the womb. And then one has a strong mind, strong intelligence, that's able to do things and think clearly. Otherwise, then if we grow in this society, people are just dulled by sense gratification. Give the kids some lollipops, put them in front of a television set. In other words, just keep them entertainment. Entertainment is dulling. Dulling the, what we say, the intelligent faculties of the living entity. And we do that because we think, 
we're giving them something to make them happy, but it's not. It's just dulling their brains. So this dullness represents this demon, Sakadashura, and false pride. False pride means that he was a powerful personality, but he committed offense, and now he was reduced to a just a bag of air. <laughs> and now, so this false, the false pride comes with, I have, I'm like this, and I'm attached to being like this. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether it's good or bad. This is me, pride in what we say, my personality, my character, who I am, materially. So this is Sakata Shura. And Krishna destroys that, like that. And Krishna did by through this pastime. <clears throat> okay, the next demon, we're all going to talk about pride now. The next demon is Trinavarta. He's the whirlwind demon. You've heard of all Trinavarta? He represents pride produced by useless scholarship, which gives rise to, to wrangling debates and arguments, dry reasoning, logical indulgence, and dry logical indulgence, and associates with people who are attached to such types of debates. It produces controversy, which breeds, which causes disloyal on the path of bhakti. Persons such as Mayavadis and those who are attached to the impersonal aspects of God, they become what we say affected by this Trinavarta mentality. It's a breeding place of demoniac and sinful activities, sinful philosophies like that. Lord Krishna becomes moved by the humility of his devotee who carefully avoids this fault. And he strangles the demon and removes the thorn from his devotee's endeavor and devotional service. According to Brahma Vaivarta Puran, in his last life, he was a king called Panyadesha, named Sahasraksa, who was cursed by Durvasa Muni for appearing naked before him while the king was enjoying with his 1,000 wives. He was cursed to live on earth for 100,000 years and then to be killed by Lord Krishna himself. That's the history of this demon. And so Kamsa sends Trinavarta to get Krishna. Now he has the power to fly in the sky. Krishna is sitting on his mother's lap and his mother is so happy and she's nursing him and Krishna is sitting there enjoying the presence of his mother. But then Krishna realizes, uh-oh, here comes a demon. So Krishna does something, he becomes heavy. His weight becomes so heavy that his mother can't hold him anymore. So she puts him on the ground. And then the demon comes, and when he comes, he creates this whirlwind, which throws leaves and dust and dirt all the way up in the sky, and no one can see anything. And when he does that, he comes and he picks up Krishna. And Krishna decides, oh, it's time to go for a ride. <laughs> so he's, he's enjoying. So the demon's flying in the sky and Krishna's holding on his back. And the demon's looking for the chance to kill Krishna. And then all the residents of Vrindavan, they can't find Krishna's mother. His soda is crying, where's my baby? She's, she's besides herself. All the other ladies come to help Mother Soda find Krishna. Krishna and they can't find Krishna everywhere and no one can see clearly because there's dust whirling in the sky and everyone is in anxiety and Mother Yasoda is just oh she's besides herself because of her love for Krishna she can only think what happened to my boy he must be in a very terrible situation and now but Krishna is having fun he's riding in the sky you, know, you have to pay to go on these rides nowadays but Krishna did it for free so he's riding in the sky and then the demons taking him higher and Krishna's enjoying and then Krishna said all right game's over <laughs> so then he grabs the demon by the neck starts squeezing him <clears throat> And the demon's saying, oh, and he's choking. 
and he's trying to throw Krishna off and he can't do it. And Krishna's just, he's a little baby, he's only like two years old, he's going, and this demon, ah! <laughs> and this demon is just doing everything he can to throw Krishna off, but Krishna's not letting go. <laughs> Finally, he squeezed him so much that his eyes bulge out of his socket and he just went crashing to the ground. <laughs> he hit the ground so hard and it just, he landed on a rock and it just turned into a mush. Splattered him all different directions. <laughs> Haribo, Jai. It's on, right? It's a good movie, huh? Special effects. <laughs> Imagine seeing that on, on the movie. That's the next movie, Mother Vishaka, Krishna killing demons. <laughs> it's really far out. Once we put, once everyone knows about Prabhupada, then we can put all this stuff on the main theater. <laughs> then they'll say, yeah, let's go see Krishna killing demons. This is really nice. People like that. They kill each other, so maybe they'll go to the movies to watch Krishna killing demons. So, so and then this demon, who do, what does he represent? Useless scholarship, just collecting knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Sometimes people have this philosophy. You, you're considered, considered intelligent by how much you know. It doesn't matter what you know, it's how much you know. It's just, you know, you know about everything. There's a story called The Scholar and the Boatman. You've heard of that story? No? Okay. So one scholar, he's a real scholar, he comes to India, and now he wants to cross the Ganga and get to the other side. So he, he knows he has to take a boat. So there's one very simple peasant-like person, he has a boat. So he commissions this person and he gets in the boat. And he's going across the Ganga, and he's looking at this boatman, and he's starting to think, this person doesn't know much. <laughs> he's proud of his scholarship. So he says to the, the boatman, Mr. Boatman, um, can you, do you know about oceanography? He said, what was that word you said? <laughs> oceanography. No. He said, you're a boatman, you're on water, you should know the science of oceanography. I just roll my boat, that's all. I get a few pies here and there, I'm happy. He says, because you don't know oceanography, 50% of your life is wasted. 50%. And so he says, all right. So he's rowing, he's still getting his boat across the Ganga. Finally, after some time, you know, the, the scholar is a little bit, you know, chiding him. So he says, Mr. Boatman, do you know about astronomy? How the cosmos is arranged with all its various stars and planets and everything. He says, I look up in the sky once in a while. Yeah, it's nice. No, no, do you know the science of astronomy? No. He says, Boatman says, um, the scholar says, 75% of your life is wasted. Okay. So he keeps rowing his boat. He's not phased. Finally, the storm comes and it starts raining and it starts really raining and it's pouring. And then the boat starts to fill up with water and it's becoming higher and higher and it looks like the boat's going to capsize. And so, the boatman's doing everything to control a boat, but then he says to the scholar, do you know how to swim? He says, no. He says, 100% of your life is wasted. <laughs> so, useless knowledge. I remember I went, I was, you know, we go to colleges and universities and we give classes sometimes for the, the teachers and writers. So I went to one university and I was invited to this one professor. And so he wanted to take me into his office and he wanted to speak before the class. So I went in and he had a huge office 
and three of his walls were filled with books and the ceiling was high and it went all the way up to the ceiling you couldn't reach the books and I was looking wow I was thinking this is useless <laughs> You could put some nice pictures there instead. <laughs> he just had all, I'm sure he didn't read everything. There's people who just like to collect knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Prabhupada would always make certain statements. And these persons, they're so, what we say, Prabhupada said, you know, they're PhD, BA, FIC, FIC means face in crowd. <laughs> and, you know, they have all these literary things. What does PhD mean? Means uh, permanent head damage. <laughs> so, you know, you can't, you know. I remember we were preaching and uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio there, and we had this one person who was really a scholar so um, I, I said, well, we got this scholar. I was talking to Radhanath Maharaj. We got this scholar coming. He said, yeah, yeah, it's going to be tough. Because <laughs> you can't tell them anything. <laughs> they know everything. <laughs> so we used to give classes at night. And Maharaj would speak and he would come to the class. He was nice. And he would always ask questions. And then Maharaj would answer his questions, and he would always ask a question based on the answer. And he could never come to a conclusion. He would never be satisfied. He asked another question every time he got an answer. So he was coming. We had programs practically every night in a week, so he was coming. So we thought he's sincere, but he can't understand anything. <laughs> he's got too much intelligence. <laughs> they call it overintelligence. They say, if you tell a person who is over-intelligent, go to your nose, he goes this way. <laughs> Can't go that, it's too simple to go that way. <laughs> so we decided to uh, give him some service. We thought maybe that would help him. So we told him, do you know how to make, do you know gardening? He said, yeah, I know gardening really well. I'm good at it, good. We need a garden for the deities. So come on tomorrow during the day and we'll, you can make a garden for Gornitai. Came, he came, he was all ready. We put him out in the yard and he was there by himself the whole day. That night he came in from the program. He was like a little kid. He was so happy. He was joyful. He was just like smiling. And he said, now I understand everything. <laughs> And we said, well, what happened? He said, I was making this garden. I was feeling so happy. I don't know where this happiness come from. So I said, yeah, because you're doing service for the Lord and the Lord was pleased. Therefore, he blessed you. Oh, so he was so happy and he was thinking. I said, we said, can you do it tomorrow? Finish it up? He said, yeah. So the next day he goes out there and then he's out there most of the day. He comes in at night and he's totally bummed out <laughs> complete the opposite so he said well, what happened he said I did everything the way I did it the first day but I didn't get the same result get the point he calculated I moved the dirt this way with the left hand at this angle and I pushed it into the ground and so maybe I should do it exactly the same way so he was like an empiricist trying to analyze devotional service by a mechanical operation. Just like, okay, you do it like this and you do like, okay. I get my beads, I stand like this, I go like this, I close my eyes. That's the way you do it. That's how you chant Japa, right? <laughs> And that's, that's, that's bliss. <laughs> so, and then I see other person saying, that must be a secret position. <laughs> so, mechanically trying to bring about 
the results of bhakti by doing it, you know, it's more like the rituals. So he couldn't under, and then finally we told him, because you did it to serve the Lord the first day, the Lord was pleased and you felt his mercy. But the second day you were just saying, you were calculating that his mercy depends on how you do it. See, we did it this way, did it that way, but it's not, it's about consciousness like that. His consciousness was completely different the second day. He was trying to, to mechanically bring about the results. So that's, how did I get off on this subject? Where do we start from? Huh? Huh? Oh, unnecessary, oh yeah, 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 necessary scholarship. So there's a lot of persons, just like sometimes academia tries to understand bhakti. And they come and they write, they observe bhakti, and then they write their articles, they write their opinions on bhakti. But bhakti cannot be penetrated by academia. One cannot understand Krishna by one's intelligence, no matter how powerful and sharp it is. Krishna can only be understood when he wants to be. And when he won't, he, he reveals himself when he's pleased. That's how bhakti works. When Krishna's pleased, you get the mercy. If Krishna is not pleased, Rama Eva he gave alone. And that means everything you do will not result in anything. So the whole idea is to try to please Krishna. The mechanics or how we do it are secondary. They're secondary. So people get attached to the externals and not the substance. So scholarship, you know, useless scholarship. What is the use of knowing how many people are in China. <laughs> the Chinese might find it interesting, but you know, I know the population of China. So what? <laughs> Will that get you back to Godhead? <laughs> no, the point is there's a lot of useless knowledge. And now you can see, you go anywhere, right? You can Google anything and you can find some some useless I mean some of the knowledge is practical and can be used in our day to day life. But most of us just just wrangling. Knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Like that. So this is Trinavarta. And he becomes proud of it. He becomes proud of that. I am a scholar. I have so many uh, educational carriers. And, but it doesn't save you at the time of death. Only bhakti can. So this useless scholarship and devotees have to watch out. We should study Prabhupada's books in order to learn how to process devotional service and not for knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Philosophical spiritual knowledge is important, but it has a purpose. It fixes us in devotional service and it brings us on the right path towards Krishna's lotus feet. But just reading books and being a scholar for the sake of knowledge will not attract Krishna. It doesn't attract Krishna. Krishna is attracted only by bhakti. And jnana is a path that keeps one in the direction of bhakti, but jnana is not an end in itself. So knowledge is just like the gopis. Oh, they're not scholars, but still they're considered the highest form of devotees. Why? Because they love Krishna completely. They have no other desire than to serve Krishna to please Krishna. When Krishna Krishna had a headache, Narada Muni came to see Krishna and said, Krishna, how are you? Oh, Narada, I got a headache. Really? Is there anything I can do? He said, there's only one thing that can relieve my headache. What's that? The dust of the lotus feet of my devotees. They have to have put that dust on my head. So Narada said, all right, I'll try and find some of your devotees and get dust. So he went to the Rishishari 
the Rishicharis, which are the sages of Dandakaranya forest. And uh, he said, uh, you know, they said, Narada, how are you? It's good to see you. Where have you been? I just was with Krishna. Oh, how is he? He has a headache. Really? Is there anything we can do? Yes. He says, there's only way, the one thing you can do to relieve his headache, he wants the dust from your feet to put on his head. That's the only antidote. Are you kidding, Narada? You're speaking blasphemy you now. Put our foot deaths on the head of the Supreme Personality of Godhead? We'll go to hell. Narada, don't ask. So Narada left and he went to another group. They said the same thing. Finally, he came back to Krishna. Nobody wants to give the dust. What to do? Krishna said, go to Vrindavan and ask the gopis. So they went to the, he went to Vrindavan and the gopis were there and I, oh, here he is, Narada Muni. And we can always find out about Krishna from Narada. Hey, Narada, have you seen Krishna? Yeah. How is he? Well, he's got a head, oh, he's got a headache. Oh my God, that's terrible. What can we do? Well, he said that only the dust of the feet of the devotees, you, if you put, take your foot dust, I'll bring it to him and put it on his head and his headache will be gone. Really? Narada, don't waste time. Come on, here, take this dust. They're scraping the dust. Go, go. Don't you know, Narada says, you'll go to hell if you put your foot dust on Krishna's head. They said, we'll go to hell. It doesn't matter as long as Krishna's dust, foot headache is getting relieved. That's the gopi's love. They don't have any personal desire. They only want to please Krishna. <clears throat> So what is their scholarship? Nothing in terms of philosophy, but they love Krishna. <clears throat> That's all. Their love is pure. Their love is un, what we say, uh, uninterrupted. It's continuous. And so, and a lot of persons are proud of knowledge. Now we'll talk about another type of pride which is a pride, which is the strongest of all pride. Now I'm gonna ask you a question. Okay, you ready? I'll make this a little active. Now people have pride because of birth. People have pride because of being in a, what we say, an elevated position. People have pride because of wealth. People have pride because of strength. People have pride because of beauty. And sometimes, many times, people, because they're so renounced, they're proud that they're, they're actually renounced. So, what would you say, out of all these different types of pride, is the strongest of all forms of pride? What pride is the hardest one to get rid of out of all of these that we mentioned? Strength, fame, wealth, beauty, uh, knowledge, renunciation. What would you think? Renunciation. Renunciation? I renounce that statement. <laughs> <laughs> no. Not renunciation. It's not as strong as another one. Bonnie? Knowledge. Sounds like it could be, but it's not. <laughs> fame. If I'm the, if I'm fame, I'm never the same. I got a name. Got what's your next statement? Huh? You make a claim for fame? That's a shame. <laughs> uh, that's, that statement is very lame. <laughs> okay. That, that was free. That didn't cost anything. Okay, so here is the form of pride that is the most manigriva, nalikuvera manigriva. They represent that. What is that? 
Money is the honey. <laughs> money, wealth. Those who have wealth there have the strongest form of pride. And Krishna uses this particular pastime to bring that out. These two persons, Mani Griva and Nala Kuvara, they were sons of Kuvara. Kuvara is the wealthiest person. He's so wealthy, he's the wealthiest person of the demigods, that he even lends money to Krishna. Yeah, this is a story. When Krishna came to the material world, after When Brigha Muni was testing who is the, the real personality of Godhead, is it Brahma, is it Shiva, or is it Vishnu? He tested all three. And he insulted Brahma, he criticized Shiva, and he kicked Vishnu. So he committed an offense to all three. Brahma became angry, Shiva became really angry, and Vishnu said, thank you very much for kicking me. Um, actually, maybe your foot is hurt, so maybe I should massage your foot because my chest is very hard, I'm a Kshatriya. And then, Brigoth understood that Vishnu is the Supreme, but Lakshmi was there and she didn't like that. She became angry and she cursed that the Brahmins will always be poor. And then she was so upset that she left and she went to the material world. Now Narayan is without Lakshmi. So now he decides to find her. So he comes into the material world as Srinivas, a poor Brahmin. And that's a beautiful, beautiful story. How he's chasing her to, to again marry her. Finally, this is a long, long, long pastime. He finally catches up with Lakshmi. Now he wants to get married, he has no money. So he goes to Kuvera and says, give me a loan. Kuvera says, I'll loan you money, but you have to pay me back with interest. <laughs> and Krishna, in the form of Srinivas, agrees. That is the story of Balaji. How many of you have been to Balaji Temple? That, that's why that temple is so rich, is because everyone is giving money to Balaji so he can pay back the loan that he had he borrowed from Kuvera. That's the history of that pastime. So even Krishna has to borrow from Kuvera. So, therefore, uh, okay, so Mani Griva and Nala Kuvera are sons of Kuvera, and they are proud of their wealth, and so they use their wealth to enjoy sense gratification. So they're sporting with young girls in the heavenly planets on the banks of the Mandakini River, Mandaki, Mandakini River, which is the Ganga in the heavenly planets. And they're intoxicated, and they're running around naked, and they're bathing in the water. And then all of a sudden, Nara da Muni Bajai Vina Radhika Ramana Nam. He comes playing on his Vina. And then he sees this sight. The girls immediately, they saw this great sage. So they, they come and immediately they put their clothes off. But these two guys, they were so drunk, they ignored Narada and they just remained naked. So Narada said, Oh, you want to remain naked? Okay, become trees. I curse you that in your in the next life you'll become a tree. And then they came to their senses, fell at the feet of Narada, and apologized. Narada said, all right, I can't change the curse, but I can change some of the principles. You'll become trees in the courtyard of Nanda Maharaj. And after a hundred years of the demigods, Krishna will come and liberate you from that birth. <clears throat> and Krishna did that when he was in Vrindavan. He knocked those two trees down, and those two trees, these two powerful demigods came out, and they paid their obeisances to Krishna, offered beautiful prayers, and went back to their position. But Prabhupada writes in that particular story that of all the forms of pride, 
Wealth is the strongest. Well, one who's rich, it's hard to become humble. <laughs> it's hard to become humble. Why? Because they think, I've made it. I can get anything. I can do anything. I can control others. Wealth has this intoxicating thing. And even if, even pious people, they become attached to their wealth. They understand sometimes that their wealth is a gift from God, but still, they don't really take up devotional service in a serious way because wealth has a certain element to it that it causes one to want more. The more money you have, the more you want. <laughs> Unless you're a devotee, then the devotee uses the money for Krishna's service. But in the material world, people are addicted to wealth. It becomes an addiction more and more and more. And so, when one is in that situation, one cannot feelingly call out for Krishna. One cannot chant the holy names from the Lord with a heart full of what we say, uh, contrition, the heart full of remorsefulness, because they see that that wealth becomes, a, it's, it's a crutch. So Krishna sometimes will take everything away from a person who's like that just to make them humble. And then in that humble position, they, they can fall at the feet of the Lord like that. Like that. So how to prevent that? If you have wealth, use it for Krishna's service. Take what you need to live nicely and use it for the service of the Lord. Then that wealth becomes your ticket back to Godhead. In other words, it's an opportunity to serve the Lord like that. And the more you use in Krishna's service, guess what happens? And this happens all the time. Krishna gives you more. People who are wealthy and use that money for the service of the Lord, Krishna gives them more. because Why? Because they're using it in the right way, like that. Otherwise, we get attached to comfortable living and the idea that I'm successful. But success is, success is to have shelter at the lotus feet of the Lord. That's real success, because there, everything is there. In other words, the material energy cannot touch you there. But if you're wealthy, you're miserable. <laughs> Why? Because everyone says, oh, he's my friend, he's rich. <laughs> Who are you a friend of your, that person or are you a friend of his money? So a lot of people become the false friend of rich people because it good prestige. I know wealthy people. <laughs> I ain't gonna tell this story, no, I better not. <laughs> I'll tell it on the side when you ask me this one. It's too, too, too difficult to tell. Should I tell it? <laughs> I'm not sure. But I won't mention any names. Okay. One very wonderful devotee in our movement, was invited to meet some really wealthy people. Now this person is a sannyasi, and he's very renounced, and he's with these wealthy people, not only wealthy people, but very high posted political people in India. The President of the United States is there. The President of India is, not the President of India, the Prime Minister of India is there. So he's, among, he's there amongst all these wealthy people, and they're all doing their thing. And he's just a guest also. So he's thinking, hmm, I'm a sannyasi. Hmm, what am I doing here? <laughs> so he's just thinking, hmm, I have nothing to do with all of this stuff. <laughs> but still, I've been invited. And so he's there, and he's just watching the birds because it was an open air program and he was watching the birds were flying overhead. And he was thinking, I wonder what one of those birds is gonna do. Hmm. 
You get the point. What do birds do, you know? <laughs> so he was thinking that that would make this whole party kind of changed a little. <laughs> so, in other words, he was bored to death. <laughs> you might think, oh, I'm with the President of the United States, I'm with the President of India, and he's all these very important, wealthy, famous Hollywood-type people are there. This is really prestigious. He was bored. <laughs> he, he was thinking, he gave up all of this attachment to all this stuff. And he came just as a guest and then also to maybe to, to preach. But really he didn't have much of a thing to do that night. So he was just there. And he describes it. So this is a devotee. A devotee doesn't have any interest in any of this stuff. He thinks, he thinks these people are miserable. <laughs> Unless they're the devotee. And you're wealthy, that's one thing. But if you're wealthy, you're miserable. You're pretty miserable. There's two kinds of suffering. Too much, too little. If you have too little, you suffer, you struggle. You can't really make it. You have to struggle just to exist. And therefore, you can't perform devotional service with, with a fixed mind. Because you're always struggling. But if you have too much, and then you're just deluded by your false position and you don't have time or don't see the importance. Or if you do, you do it in a tokenistic way and then you just move on like that. But someone who's in between, who doesn't, is not deluded by, you know, material success and not overwhelmed by material suffering, can easily take the bhakti can easily take the bhakti, someone in between. That's most of us, right? But this wealth is a very, very strong form of pride and it makes it very hard to practice devotional service. So Krishna destroyed the pride of these two personalities and gave them back their position in the heavenly planets. So this is the story of Nalakuvera and Mani Griva. Now there's another type of pride, and this pride is by a demon called Aristosura. Now what is Aristosura's pride? He represents the pride of fraudulent, fraudulent religionists who practices have been concocted by cheaters. Due to a contaminated condition, they show disrespect to the process of pure devotional service and to Krishna himself. Fraudulent religions. People like to concoct their own religion. Sometimes a, people, a person will have a dream and in the dream they'll say, he's the next avatar and so he posts that everywhere. I had a dream, I'm the chosen one. And then somebody, people follow him, he's very charismatic, he can speak nicely, and he pr propagates his philosophy, and people come, and then there's a false religion. So that's Aristosura. Aristosura is a bull, and he was a gigantic bull. He came into Vrindavan, and he, his steps into Vrindavan were so strong that the whole ground was like an earthquake. Everything was shaking. He was so huge, his tail was touching the clouds, and every time his hoof hit the, hit the ground, it was shaking. All the inhabitants that were pregnant, the ladies, had miscarriages simply by the trembling of the earth caused by Aristosura. Krishna didn't like this. He didn't like his dis devotees being disturbed, so he challenged him. He said, you rascal. Krishna saw that everyone was running away. He said, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, come back. And this way he was about to, cha he challenged him. And then Arisasura took up the challenge and he came running at Krishna at full speed and Krishna just grabbed him by the horns and threw him 40 feet back in the other direction. Just like a person picks up a piece of paper and throws it. <laughs> so easily. The demon didn't give up. He shook off all the dust. He was snorting fire and he was just, he 
charged at Krishna and Krishna took him by the horns and twirled him around and whipped him around, threw him on the ground and then with his sweet little soft lotus feet, he started kicking the demon, kicking him and 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 kicking him. And, kicking him. and finally after some time the demon started passing stool and urine and blood and vomiting and then Jai, he died. Haribo. <laughs> All glories to Krishna. <laughs> and Radharani said, hey, you killed the bull. You're supposed to be Gopal, the protector of the cows. Krishna said he's a demon. Doesn't matter, he's still a bull. <laughs> so that's another story. <laughs> that's a beautiful story. Anyway, Krishna argues with Radharani. But this is the story of Aristosaur. So there are persons who like to concoct religions. Religion, Dharma is given by God. Dhar dharma can only be enunciated by the Lord. It cannot be created by man, cannot be created by anyone. Dharma, Shaksa, Tugapraga, what is it? Dharma, Shaksa, to Bhagavatam Pranitam. The principles of religion are coming from the Supreme Personality of Godhead Himself into the hearts of His pure devotees, and they practice that, and that becomes what well, they say Dharma. A Paurushad. A Paurushad means not man made. So real religious principles are coming from the, from the source, Krishna Himself. But there's people who like to concoct, for the sake of name and fame, religious principles. And therefore you find so many, many, many types of concocted ideas. But it says they, they're trying to get followers, they're trying to get prestige, they're trying to get money, they're trying to get power in some way. And they show disrespect to pure devotional service. So that is the example of Aristosura. So he's a kind of pride that represents the neglect of bhakti and the false principles of religion. Religion means to love God. <laughs> that is the real definition of religion. Prema Pumarta Mahan. To love Krishna is the purpose of religion and the goal of religion. We might say spirituality, but religion means those rules and regulations that are enunciated, that we follow in order to achieve the path of bhakti or pure devotional service like that. So real religion is loving God. That is the person, that is the actual goal of all religions, how to love Krishna, like that. So there's so many in the name, but it's a shame because they don't play the right game and they get everlasting infamame. That's not the right word. <laughs> no fame. Come on, you're, you're slow. Now, you're so slow, you're not going to go. What? Mine? <laughs> oh, okay. He's good. He's good. He's really good. <clears throat> okay, he's my guru. <laughs> Casey. Casey represents vanity of thinking, I am a great devotee and guru. <laughs> Also, the false ego arising from attachment from wealth and material accomplishments. In the Brahma Bhaivarta Purana, in his last life, Keshi was Supar, Suparsvaka, one of the brothers of a Gandharma who became Palamba and Bakasura. So here, Keshi represents, I am a great devotee. And we remember back in the old days of Krishna consciousness when we first joined. We would be so enthusiastic in our devotional service. We'd be working hard, getting up early, chanting our rounds, going to all the functions, going out on Sankirtan, 
and spending all days. Then after a while, we would, we would think, you know, I'm a pure devotee. I made it. <laughs> I did it. You can see. It's obvious. Just look at my record, you know. I'm fixed, chanting Hare Krishna. We used to call that PDS, pure devotee, pure devotee syndrome. <laughs> it's like a disease. <laughs> so sometimes it goes, it's like that. One gets the idea that because I'm doing so much, or because I know so much, or because I've, people tell me how great I am, then I must be a great devotee. They don't lie. <laughs> so that that idea, but a devotee, Prabhupada said, a devotee always thinks I'm the lowest. Somehow, by the mercy of Krishna, coming through my spiritual master, he's so kind that he's engaging me in Krishna's service. He's giving me the knowledge, he's giving me the intelligence how to do things. It's by his mercy, I'm making advancement. It's by His mercy I'm receiving some kind of credit for what I do, but actually it is His mercy. So the always always thinks like that. The always never takes credit for anything and always gives credit to the Lord or the Lord's devotee, the spiritual master. So Krishna killed Casey. Casey came. He's a horse. He's a powerful horse. He came running into Vrindavan to destroy Vrindavan. And he made a horrible sound. And he came charging at Krishna. Krishna grabbed him and threw him. And Krishna came. And then he came at Krishna again. And this time Krishna stuck his hand in Casey's mouth. Now Prabhupada said, Krishna is so intelligent, he knows everything. He knows that if you want to control the, a horse, where do you control it? How do you control a horse? Mouth. His mouth is how you control a horse. So Krishna knew that. So he put his hand in his mouth. And then he expanded his hand where it got so big that Keshi couldn't breathe. And then he suffocated and died. Haribo. <laughs> Jai Sri Krishna. <laughs> so we like when demons are killed. So he represents that I'm a great guru. Bhakti Siddhanta used to say, if one thinks he's a guru, he's a guru. What is a guru? A cow. <laughs> so one may be in a position to be a spiritual master, a guru. But if one identifies the position as one's identity, that is considered false ego. I play the role of a guru, but I'm a servant. That's the, un that's the understanding. I'm, whatever position I have, it doesn't really change my identity. My identity stays the same. I am servant. I serve in the role of a guru. I serve in the role of a temple manager, I serve in the role of a cook, I serve. So it's all a matter of service and not identifying with the service as oneself. Although we have labels, just like we even take labels, we think I'm, think, we think I'm a man, I'm a woman, I'm from India, I'm from this country, I'm, I'm like this. These are all what we say designations that have nothing to do with our real identity. They have nothing to do with our real identity, but because we are so connected with it, we identify. And we think, that's me. But actually it's not. Because we could be born in one situation in one life, and in the next life be in a completely different situation. Or even a completely different species, not to speak of human species. So, even the roles we play, especially in devotional service here, are designations simply for the sake of service. This is important to understand this. We have to play the role 
A guru has to play the role of a guru. A brahmachari has to be a brahmachari. Brahmachari can't act like a sannya, uh, a grihasta. Grihasta cannot act like a brahmachari. But that still doesn't change the fact that we are servant in every role we play. So that's your real identity. That's why Bhakti Siddhanta said, one who thinks he's a guru is a guru. <laughs> so, identifying with one's real identity. Okay, so these are five demons. And the last, not these are four demons. And then the last is the Yagya Brahmins. The Yagya Brahmins, Krishna was hungry and he was with Balaram. He told Balaram, he told, he told the cowherd brothers, hey, me and Balaram are really hungry. Go to the Brahmins and ask them to give us something to eat. So they went to the Yagya Brahmins and the Yagya Brahmins were doing their puja, they were doing their homas, they were worshiping their deities. And they came and they said, oh, my dear Brahmins, you are so, so intelligent, you are so magnanimous and so generous. We're here, Krishna and Balaram are so hungry, please give us something to eat. The Brahmins didn't even pay attention to the boys. They just kept doing their puja. But in their mind they were thinking, these boys are just disturbing us. So they completely ignored their requests. They went back and told them, Krishna, we tried, but they didn't listen to us. We didn't get anything. Krishna said, that's the nature of the begging game. Sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. Don't be disturbed. Now go to the wives of the Brahmins and ask them for food. They went to the wives of the Brahmins. They said, oh, Krishna, Balaram are outside. They're so hungry. Oh, really? What can we do? Well, give us some food. Okay. And they went and they, whatever they had, they gave. They came back and Krishna says, just see, these simple ladies, they could understand the the nature of bhakti, but these Brahmins who were proud of their Brahminical position neglected to respond to the request of Krishna. And then later on, of course, they realized it. So this, this is a type of pride that comes with birth. I'm a Brahmin. You are what? I'm a Brahmin. What's that? Well, I've been born in a priestly family, but what do you do? Well, I work as an IT expert. <laughs> That's sudra. <laughs> Prabhupada says uh, any kind of IT or engineering is all sudra work. It's not Brahminical. <laughs> and I'm sorry if I offended any IT guys here. <laughs> so. <laughs> So, Brahmana, Brahman means patan, patan, yajan, yajan, dana, pratigraha. Brahman knows the scriptures, can teach the scriptures, worships the deity, can teach others how to worship the deity, gives in charity and accepts charitable gifts. That's the six activities of a Brahman. So, one may be born in that family, but one has to practice the, the qualities of a Brahman to be actually designated as a Brahman. But when Prabhupada brought his devotees to India, his uh, dancing white elephants, he called us, <laughs> we came to India and uh, some of the people, especially in Vrindavan and other areas, were saying, oh, yeah, okay, in your next life, we bless you to take birth as a Brahmin. <laughs> so they were saying to the devotees, that we bless you to become a Brahmin. And they went to Prabhupada and Prabhupada said, yes, a crow is blessing a cow. <laughs> so what was the point is that a Vaishnava, one who's engaged in devotional service, is above the Vanashram system. Gopibhatapadakamalayar, dasa dasa anadas. Lord Chaitanya said, I'm not a Brahmin, I'm not a Kshatriya, I'm not a Vaishya, I'm not a Sudra, I'm not Sannyasi, I'm not Brahmachari, I'm not Krihasa, I'm not Vana. What, what are I? I'm servant of the servant of the servant of the damsels of Raj. In other words, any material designation, especially those that are considered lofty, such as Brahman, 
can cause one to think in the wrong way and develop a type of pride based on that. <clears throat> so that's the pride of Van Ashram, a good birth in a good family and thinking that one is, uh, what we say, better than others. Jai Sisi, si. Kishore Kishore Ki Jai. So these are the six forms of pride mentioned by Raghunath Das Goswami and, and illustrated by these six forms of demons. Any questions about pride or some of the elements in relationship to pride? Bonnie? Mm -hmm. Your microphone is here. Hare Krishna. I have a question nice from something from something you said earlier, and if if it's too irrelevant, um, then you can choose. Them. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, before you said, well, we're not we're not related to the, to the family we're in. Of course, we're not related to the family we're in. So, if if fourteen generations are liberated, if someone becomes a pure devotee, is it 14 generations from the family during the birth when they become a pure devotee, or when they started devotional service in a different birth, maybe even? <laughs> Tricky question. Uh, you have to ask Krishna, who knows? <laughs> I would use philosophical understanding is that from the time one becomes a pure devotee. Prabhupada says, when you become a pure devotee, then 14 generations, what does that mean? He says, Prabhupada says, those 14 generations of family members in their next birth, they're born into a Vaishnava family. That's their liberation. It's not that they go back to Godhead they get a chance in their next life to take up the pure devotional service themselves. So it happens when you, bec when you become a pure devotee, not when you begin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's how the statement is worded. When you become a pure devotee, then you liberate 14 generations. Okay? But even if you're a devotee and don't make it to pure devotional service, still you help many, many family members simply by the power of your own devotional service. It's always auspicious, even if it's not pure. But pure devotional service is so powerful, it can change, it can liberate the whole world. Prabhupada said, just give me one pure devotee and I can change the whole world. He used the example of the moon. When the moon is in the sky, it can light up the whole sky, but then you have millions of stars. They can't compare to the light of one moon. So that one moon is the pure devotee's presence. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Prabhu. Sorry about the IT jokes. <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, like I had a follow up to Mataji's question, like uh, like when when a uh, when somebody becomes a pure devotee, like we heard the pastime of Dhruva Maharaj that his mother also went back to God and and even some like uh, in South India Vaishnava Acharyas uh, I think, uh, What's I, uh, in so South India yeah. The past time, like uh, Varadraj told that any, everybody connected to you also will go back to God and not only, I forgot, I, was it Ramanujacharya or was uh. it Kanchi Purna? I'm not sure. Hmm. So like, is it that uh, immediate family members will like go back to God or is it that? 14 generations, I mean anyone that's within that family. They, they, they'll, they'll get the opportunity, they or get liber they get they get birth in in a in a devotee family in their next life, and then that from the time they're born, they can begin devotional service. Thank you, mm -hmm. thank you. And as soon as you begin devotional service, your devotional service includes liberation. So, if you're engaged in devotional service, you're already on the liberated platform. 
Liberation is a byproduct of devotional service. One doesn't have to try for liberation separately. Gyan and what is it? Yeah. Yeah. Bhukti and Mukti become servants of Bhakti. Bhukti means liberation, Mukti means material enjoyment. They automatically come. <clears throat> yes, question. Who has the we have any more questions? Yes, Radha Bhakti. Welcome. <laughs> Gurmaj, how to have um, positive self-esteem and at the same time be rightly humble in when spiritual life? When you know you're not the doer, that's all. When you think you're the doer, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, what is that verse? 327. Prakriti Kriyamanani Guni karmani sarvasya ahankara vimudatma kartaham matimanyate. The conditioned soul under the influence of the material energy thinks himself the doer of activities which are actually carried out by material nature. In devotional service, we, we have a desire, and that desire propels us to act. And that act is, is given sanction by, by the quality of the act, and then Krishna gives the results accordingly. Even if you act properly, if Krishna doesn't give the results, then it comes out something different. In other words, you can't make anything happen. All you can do is try. If you understand that, then you'll never be attached to thinking you're the doer. It's only by the mercy of Krishna coming through his devotees that he makes things happen. And if he doesn't want things to happen, it doesn't happen. <laughs> you have a right to perform your duties, but you're not entitled to the results of every activities. Never consider yourself the cause of the results of activity, but never be attached to not doing your duty. So you still have to do your duty, but don't be attached to the results. Your attachment to the results makes you think you're the doer. So just to expand on that quickly, um, suppose there's a devotee who we feel is um, being maybe hard on us or maybe even abusive. When do we know that the line between standing up for ourselves and being a servant and saying, sorry, Prabhu, it's my fault? What does that mean, standing up for yourselves? So I don't have a specific example, but um, let's say somebody... <laughs> This is a really bad example, but let's say somebody was trying to test who is a pure devotee and, and did what that devotee did when he came and he kicked Lord Vishnu. I'm pretty, if somebody kicked me, I wouldn't say, is your foot okay? I would probably have other colorful language to use for that person. So is that, like, when is it okay to stand up for yourself versus, like, is when that... You, you, have, you have to stand up for what is truth and what is right. And there's ordinary things, and there's also spiritual principles. You speak. You should not, in the name of of being humble, not act in the proper way. It's like Prabhupada. He was very strong in defending the truth, but he was defending Krishna's position and the shastras. But he wasn't doing it for his own prestige or for his own aggrandizement. He did it as a service to the Lord and for the serv to the service of those he was talking to. So we act for the benefit of others and speak the truth. It says that one of the principles of speech is to speak truthfully, beneficially, avoid speech that offends and regularly quote the scriptures. So that's mentioned as the austerity of speech, how to speak. So the situation warrants us to think how to deal with it. Sometimes we, sometimes it's better to remain quiet, sometimes it's better to speak up, depends on the situation. Depends on the persons involved also. 
But generally we don't de defend our own position. Sometimes Prabhupada defended his position not because he was defending his ego, but the, 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 un, letting people understand what is the position of a spiritual master. That one has to approach the spiritual master in the right way in order to get the mercy of the spiritual master. If one challenges the spiritual master, sometimes the spiritual master, for the sake of teaching, will put himself in the position of, of uh, correcting that person. And it looks like he's doing it to defend his own situation. But he's just teaching what is the position, how one should act, that's all. You know, like what Prabhupada did, he had Guru Puja every day. We do Guru Puja every day as part of the morning program. That was never done before. Usually Guru Puja is done once a year. Why did Prabhupada do that? Because he wanted worship? No. He knew that the Western mentality didn't know what a spiritual master was, how to worship a spiritual master, how to treat a spiritual master. He was teaching from his own position. That's all. He was using himself to teach. But if you don't know the consciousness of the person, you might perceive the activity as being something different, pretentious or something. So when you're, when you're in a situation, you have to understand what is the motivation behind what you're going to say. Is it to defend truth or is it to defend your own false ego? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's better not to say something and sometimes it's better to say something. Just like I'll give you a personal example. Uh, I received a note from a temple president who was complaining about something I was doing. And I'll tell you what I was doing. I was singing kirtan, and then during the response to what I sing, I would unconsciously hum into the microphone. So he didn't like that. So he sent me a message, Maharaj, stop humming into the microphone. It's disturbing the whole kirtan. <laughs> So, but the thing is, so I was thinking, hmm, who was he to tell me that? I said, ur, 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 ur. <laughs> I started grunting and growling, you know, and then I thought, eh, maybe he's right. I'll stop humming. <laughs> <laughs> but I got, but what happened was, I didn't say anything to him. And I wasn't so disturbed that he found fault with what I was doing. What disturbed me is that he sent a note and didn't ask to tell me himself. He said, I had somebody else deliver his message in the form of a note. So I didn't say anything. About two months later, we were sitting together, I was sitting together, I had come back to the same temple. And he said, you know, Maharaj, you know, a couple months ago I sent you that note. You know, I've been feeling bad about that ever since. <laughs> he said, I have to apologize. <laughs> I never said anything to him. I never said anything, but Krishna is in the heart. So. so sometimes we say something and sometimes it's better not to. So you have to sometimes see. And how do you see? You have to pray to Krishna. How to, how to react to this situation? What do you, what, how, how best to... And when you actually do that, when you say, my dear Lord, I'm in this situation, what do I do? Usually the intelligence comes. If you're sincerely praying. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Arka. Hare Krishna Maharaj. I'm a little bit... Uh, confused about the position of uh, Yagya Brahmanas um, when they chased away the cowherd boys um, were they like neglecting bhakti principles or, or were they devotees or would they be considered like uh, uh, neglecting the bhakti principles and like under Aristasura where you know they have fraudulent religious practice I'm not no, sure about no, that. No, they were just Ritualistic Brahmins, they were attached to their worship. 
But they don't understand that the worship ultimately was this for the Supreme Lord. So when the Supreme Lord made a request, they were more attached to the rituals than to the request of the Supreme Lord. <laughs> I'll tell you a story. One devotee, this is an interesting story. This is one devotee wanted to worship Hanuman. So he found out that if you perform these pujas, prayers, and regular worship to Hanuman for 18 days straight, strictly following all these principles, fasting, then at the end of 18 days, Hanuman will come and appear to you. So he's like determined and he's following all these principles. After 12 days, Hanuman comes and appears before him. He says, Hanuman, what are you doing? You're not supposed to come until 18 days. Yeah. <laughs> Hanuman says, this guy's nonsense. <laughs> so you get the point. <laughs> ritual for the sake of ritual, not understanding the purpose of the ritual. Christ told the, the Pharisees, you have a cup, a sepulcher, but it's full with worms. What is he saying? They were ritualistic worshiping the Lord, but there was no substance. So people do that. Four, two, three, set one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, got it done. <laughs> aim right. Yeah, I got that aim right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Archie, finished on time. <laughs> Get the point? <laughs> it's not about it's not about rituals, it's about doing the worship in such a way that you offer your devotion to Krishna while you're doing whatever you're doing. That's the and when you're doing in the altar, you're directly in contact with the Supreme Lord in his deity form. So it's about offering your heart to the Lord as you offer the articles and not <laughs> Yeah, I was number one, man. <laughs> I finished on time. I even blow the conch shell. Then it's the best. <laughs> <laughs> So we have to be careful of not falling into this ritualistic activity. Why do you do what you're doing? Um, my father did it. Why did he do it? Because his father did it. Why did he do it? Because his father did it. And why did he do it? I guess because his father did it. <laughs> So one man, he's walking around, he's wearing black. And his friend says, hey, why are you wearing black? He said, don't you know, Sargo Sink died. Oh my God, that's terrible. Sargo Sink died, yeah. So he puts on black. So he's walking around, because when someone dies in India, the idea is you wear black. It's like, it's like mourning for the dead. So he's walking around and the police officer says, hey, why are you wearing black? He says, don't you know, Sargo Singh died. My gosh, and the police officer, he puts on black. So he's got black and the police chief sees his police officer, oh, why are you wearing black? You don't know, Sargo Singh died. Oh my God, that's terrible. He puts on black. So now the police chief, they're all wearing black. And then the mayor, he sees it. He sees the police chief. He says, hey, why are you wearing black? Don't you know Sargo Singh died? Oh my God, that's terrible. He puts on black. Finally, the mayor comes and sees the governor. The governor says, hey, mayor, why are you wearing black? Governor, come on. Don't you know Sargo Singh died? Governor says, who's Sargo Singh? Uh, I guess I have to ask the police chief. <laughs> so he goes back and asks the police chief, who's Sargo Singh? Uh, uh, um, um, I, um, I'll just ask the police officer. So he asks the police officer, who's Sargo Singh? Uh, 
Um, hmm. Okay. So yeah, he goes and finds that person. He says, who's Sargo Singh? He says, you know, I don't know, but I'm going to ask this other person. And he goes to the, the, uh, the guy he sees that. He says, who's Sargo Singh? He says, Sargo Singh was my donkey. He was very dear to me. <laughs> <laughs> Blind faith. <laughs> Doing something without understanding the purpose behind it. It's called Niyamagraha. Why do we chant Hare Krishna? Because I'm supposed to. <laughs> Why do we eat prasadam? Because everybody else does. <laughs> Why do we do what we do? We have to understand why we're doing what we're doing. What's the purpose behind it? And not just do it because it's a thing to do. That's why we ask questions to get clarification. We do things to please others and that's a purpose itself. But behind that, there's also a greater purpose and that is it has a meaning because if it produces something or pleases actually Krishna himself. So we want to please Krishna and not just do things because it's tradition, it's the way. Krishna criticized his father. You're doing this yag Indra Puja, but why do you do Indra Puja? And he says, because it's what we've been doing that for every year because Indra supplies rain and therefore we are, we are agriculturalists, we need rain. Krishna says it rains on the rocks, it rains on the ocean, it rains everywhere. You don't have to worship any demigod. And he changed Nanda Maharaj's uh, mind to worship Govardhan Hill. So, but they were, the counter boys were simply doing this puja to Indra as a tradition because their family members did it, because everyone else did it. But Krishna smashed that. That's the whole pastime of Govardhan, which is coming up in October. Okay, so we're about on the verge of Archie. Any last questions before? Thank you. We have any more? Okay, let's end here. There's three minutes to Archie. Chandra, you want to lead the Gaur Archie? He's smiling. Okay. So Chandra is a beautiful singer. If he thinks he is, he's in trouble, but anyway. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I hope I didn't tell any jokes that are not allowed. <laughs> All glory is to Prabhupada. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. So everyone stand for the